Hello and welcome to Speech Communication 4397, Effective Meeting Management. Today we have the guest speaker as advertised on your syllabus. With me is Dr. Michael Fain, who is a lawyer with Exxon by day and an incredible volunteer debate coach now for several years at the University of Houston. Uh, Mike travels with our teams, is the tournament director here, and I'm going to ask him uh, shortly to summarize some of his background experience and in particular to identify some of those big tournaments that I know that you've run. We run three tournaments here at the University of Houston each year. Uh, he ran a national tournament uh, recently and for that reason we've asked him to come as a guest speaker today to talk about managing tournaments. But as I indicated before, we're looking at the tournaments kind of as a case study of what kinds of factors do you have to take into account any time you've got 1,000 or 2,000 people coming into a central location to participate in an event. So, what kind of big events have you run and what are you gearing up for this week? Oh gosh. Um, well, in the last seven years I have run 35 college and high school forensic tournaments in the greater Houston area. The largest of which would be the American Forensic Association National Championship Tournament. That was hosted at Rice University in April of 1993. Roughly 130 colleges and universities from throughout the country attended and they brought with we them, <laughs> yep, uh, U of H did attend, and we had roughly 700 students and faculty from around the country actually there representing those universities. In addition to that, we have hosted here on this campus and we're getting ready for it uh, I'm knocking on wood for next week, our annual high school tournament here at the University of Houston. Last year we had 44 high schools in attendance and about 900 students. And I'm expecting around 50 plus high schools next weekend, that's the 15th and 16th, and probably about that many students again. At the average event that I've coordinated during the last six years, we've had, I would guess, somewhere between two and 400 people in attendance most of these events being college and university in nature. Uh, you Believe me, you can really only deal with one high school tournament a year. It just saps you for several months, so. <laughs> Good. Okay. Well, where does one start okay. from your point of view? I've tried to think of how to give an overview to that question, and so this, this is going to be the answer that I think is appropriate. And this sounds so cliche-ish, but it is so true, and I will go into details to prove this in just a second. Timing and planning both before the event and during the actual event are critical to the event's success. So timing and planning. You've heard people say that timing is everything. Well, in planning a major scale event like this, it really is. Now for those of you in the current audience as well as those in the television audience who've attended any kind of high school forensic tournament, there's going to be one key difference that separates high school and collegiate events, and this difference is what makes a college-level speech or debate tournament like any national seminar or convention that you would have to conduct, say, if you were doing this as your full-time job. And that key difference is when you have a high school event in, say, the greater Houston area or in any locale throughout the country, you pretty much are going to end up with high schools from that general area and most of them will not have to deal with a hotel reservation or spending the night somewhere and many of them will have rented school buses transporting them but a collegiate event is typically far more like a major scale convention here in Texas where we have the and this is me boasting for the area that we're in where we have the number one collegiate region in the country in forensics in particular an in individual speech competition even here, where we have, say, 30 universities that compete, the average university travels 200 miles to get to the tournament. They have to stay in a hotel for probably three days. They usually have to rent cars or vans. They have to deal with meal allowances. They have to deal with tax exemption forms. And there are all of the trappings of a major trip that go into a team traveling. So even though they're actually going to a competition, per se, and in seminars, you often have people coming for educational purposes or for uh, religious purposes or what have you. The necessities of the administrator are exactly the same. 
So again, let's start by considering timing. And I think we can probably go to our very first visual aid here. And I've just tried to give you very general outline points. Communication and the timing of that communication is absolutely critical for two reasons. Number one, if you don't have proper communication and publicity of that event when the event is being held for the first time, like if you're trying to kick off some annual um, educational gathering or some teacher's meeting or some speech tournament, the first time you have an event trying to kick it up off the ground is the hardest time that you're going to have. Hopefully, if you do things right the first time, you will have a population ready to come back and pay you money, pay you registration fees, and come back to the, that event the following year. And in following years, the timing and the publicity avenues that you seek will determine whether people know to come back. Okay? So let's talk about communication, both from an advanced perspective or a near-term perspective. And what I'm about to say I will apply to speech tournaments, but because of the fact that this is so comparable to any major scale event, seminar, convention, etc., and because of the tremendous career opportunities in this kind of event, I'm going to be more general in how I explain this. Advanced communication typically occurs and needs to occur six to 12 months before the event. Now, I am not saying that you need to write every single person you're going to invite 12 months before the event. What you need to do is you need to find out whether there are any national organizations that have anything to do with your activity. For example, if I were going to plan a continuing legal education a program here in Texas, I know that the State Bar of Texas and the State Bars of surrounding states might very well have a national calendar that is published one year in advance. Well, if I can get my event on that calendar, the likelihood of me getting people from out of state and of planting that event on their mind and of them actually coming is great. So the earlier advanced communication that I make of my event, the more likely it is to be successful. So how do you find the advanced communication resources and what things are out there? Well, I've just mentioned one, national calendars. But there are other types of resources that you can use. For example, many organizations will have some type of newsletter that goes out quarterly, annually, or monthly. And if you could even get a brief description of your event in that newsletter, it's possible that you can have advance warning to potential attendees. Uh, and one good example, in high school forensics, there is a national results summary of what students accomplished what at the national championships that is hosted every year in June. And that publication is called the Rostrum. It basically tells all the high school coaches around the country, here are the workshops that are coming up around the country in the following year, and here are the results of the national championships. This is a major publicity tool for people trying to have a national high school event. Okay? If you can get your announcement in that, if that Rostrum publication, <coughs> pardon me, you have a great chance of pulling people from out of state or from throughout the state. So look for, for your advanced communication resources, national calendars published by affiliated organizations, newsletters, and there's one other thing that you should check even though you can't get put in it. I strongly advise you to look at the prior year calendar of events for that activity. And here's a good reason why. If you can look at the prior year's schedule of events, then you can make certain that you avoid highly populated weekends where there's lots of activities going on. I'll give you one good example. Uh, University of Houston is getting ready, in addition to this high school tournament that we're hosting, to have a collegiate event here on this campus the last weekend of this month. And when we have it, there'll be about 40 universities in attendance. That is a whopping number for a collegiate event. Here is why we're going to have that number of universities in attendance. I knew when looking at our calendar, which is called the American Forensic Association calendar, I knew that when I looked at the dates that we held our tournament on last year, October 12th through the 14th, 
that there were six other universities that had tournaments on about that same weekend or the weekend after. And let's be realistic. People are making monetary decisions as to where they go or don't go. And if I've got you know, a supply-demand decision where I've got six different tournaments being held in this region on the same weekend, I have suddenly thrust my own tournament in competition with all the other places having similar events. And I knew that the last weekend of September had nothing scheduled, period. So I thought that if we would move our tournament two weeks earlier, we would end up being the first tournament of the year on the college level in a six-state region offering debate. And I would avoid competition with all those other universities. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. We've ended up being the first tournament in September offering debate and all the other individual events. And I know there's about 40 universities planning on coming. What does that translate into? That translates into profit for your event if you have a fundraising event. What's going to happen to those other six universities that did not check the prior year calendars and did not consider conflicts? And I'm sorry to be on our high horse about how cool we are, but they're going to have trouble. They're going to have roughly 15 to 20 universities per school at each of their events, and they won't be as successful as ours. And so from a business sense, you... Unless they have a trick up their sleeve that we don't know about. That's true. <laughs> That's true. I mean, you never know. I mean, maybe they're going to have, you know, new dancers or something to attract people. <laughs> but um, we would never stoop that low. We would never do that. Anyhow, so I cannot... And we sure wouldn't tell about it on public that, television. This is true. <laughs> we are a very pious group. So advanced communication is very important. Check your prior your calendars for conflicts. Find out who your competition is. Call those people and ask them, what weekend are you planning your event on? Because I'm trying to avoid conflicting with you. I knew, for example, the University of Florida, which is hosting the national championships this year, was going to be holding an event on October 20th and 21st. And I did not want to be anywhere near their tournament. And, and it would be rude to, yes. to, for Bryce and U of H to book the same weekend and compete with each other, or, or for us to book a weekend that one of the local high schools needs our people for something. Right. Just, I mean, you also there are courtesy things that you take into account. Definitely. So I think I've made my pitch for advanced communication. The error that a lot of new meeting planners, or in this case, new forensic directors make, is they think that they can schedule their tournament in a vacuum. And because they have a real nice school and they are a real nice person, that people will come. Well, people will smile in your face and they will be friendly with you on the phone. But they're not going to be spending lots of money because of those two facts. Okay? They're going to be making objective decisions about what gets the most for their organization, their people, etc. Then there is near-term communication. And this is when you're getting a whole lot more direct in terms of who you contact. At this point, if you have the right near term, or if you've had the right advanced communication, you probably will have received some phone calls from people around the country asking, well, when are you going to have your awards assembly? When is your last training class scheduled? And the reason they're asking that question, they're trying to take advantage of airline schedules, they're trying to plan their personal work schedule, they're trying to decide if it's good for them to come. And if they have called you in advance, making inquiry like that, and if you can give them a legitimate answer at that point, there's, my, based on my experience, there's probably greater than a 50% chance that they will actually show up, okay? So your advanced communication will dictate the national scope, or if it's not a national event, the breadth of people attending your tournament geographically. Now, as you get closer to the event, there's one thing that you've had to develop in the meantime, and you're going to have to seek the best resource you can find for this. And I cannot stress how critical this is. You must obtain some sort of mailing list. Believe me, you do not want to start one from scratch, and there are plenty of people out there that should be doing your kind of event. Oh, check your... Okay, is it on again? The green light should Green light's on. I'll tell you, well, let me just put it right here. I think my fat is affecting it. Okay. <laughs> Either that or it's the battery. Okay. One of the two. The battery or bulge, one of the two. You need to get a direct mailing list 
so that you, you start from somewhere. For example, in our case, when we began having high school tournaments here two years ago, I called the Texas Forensic Association, which is the governing high school organization, and I asked them if they had a mailing list that we could buy from them. And it had about 280 high schools on it. That saved us enormous amounts of time, just enormous. And it also gave us names of coaches where we could possibly get the letter in the hands of the coach over that high school, presuming that teacher has not changed jobs recently. So having a good mailing list or seeking one out is critical to your event success. Let me give you some other analogies here. If I, and I'm familiar with the legal community because I get at least one good meeting request per day based on me being a licensed attorney in Texas. And the University of Houston, Southern Methodist University, South Texas College of Law, and the University of Texas at Austin all use exactly the same mailing list. They use the listing of all licensed attorneys in Texas. And they and I know this because if you know if I get a letter from UT Law School on one day, I can guarantee the following day I'll get invited to all the other school seminars too. And that's the best way of you know having a good mailing list is the best way of you ensuring you're asking the right group to attend. Now what are some wrong ways to publicize it? General announcements in the newspaper are not going to get people at your event, okay? That, because people that attend types of events like this don't seek general resources. They expect direct contact. <coughs> Secondly, as you start getting closer to your event, if you know there are some people in your general area that should be attending because they're close to you, pro you know, in terms of proximity physically, then you might want to pick up a phone and call. Now, this is what I recommend doing. You don't want to call and ask, hi, are you going to pay us a bunch of entry fees and come to our tournament? No. You instead ask, hi, we're just calling to make sure that our uh, invitation made it to you because we've been concerned about some of the timing of our mailing. And we had some come back that the labels fell off of. That's right. That's true. This and is true. And you don't know who didn't get them if the labels fall off. But having that direct personal contact, I can assure you, will, will, will increase the likelihood of people attending your tournament and, or, or attending your event. And believe it or not, a whole lot of people react far more positively to coming to an event if they've had personal contact with someone on the phone. Let me give you a good example here at the University of Houston. Let's say I am Jim Bob Freshman, and I'm coming from Class A high school, bless you, outside of Houston. And I get a letter asking me, or, or announcing, an orientation for new students. And then I get a phone call. I decide I'm going to come to this orientation. Which do you think persuaded me that this orientation was something that maybe I should consider going to, the letter or the phone call? The, the phone call, of course. So. Get ready to get on the phone. And if you don't want to get on the phone, this is not the kind of thing for you to try to do. I can testify. We spend, I mean, this weekend, for example, I will be spending a good 12 hours on the phone just calling people back, saying hi. Yeah, we got your entry. Yes, you're in our tournament. Yes, we want your money. We won't if say you that have that. a really good secretary, you can. Yes, <coughs> yes. Our secretary's in the back, and I called her, <coughs> and I asked her to call all of them and tell them, yes, all of your entries are accepted. And we'll talk about the implications of that later. OK, so communication, timing is critical. Now let's talk about possibly the most important upfront plan that you can go through. And this is the one where if you don't do this right, people will remember problems with your event. But if you do it right, you have a great chance of ensuring the success of your activity. And now we need to go to the facilities visual aid. Let's talk about considerations for facilities. I do have an overview statement to make here. And this is a, a practice that I engage in from a, that comes from my business experience. I also hold business degrees here from the University of Houston. It is very important to try to establish positive relationships with all of the parties that are outside your event that you have to deal with. 
whether it be hotel coordinators, whether it be people that reserve rooms for you on campus, or whether it's people that supply the food for your event. You need to establish a good, positive association with them, and that comes from two, two avenues. Number one, when the event is over with, make sure they get paid very quickly. And number two, try to make working with them as positive and informed an event as possible. The more information you give them, the better they will be equipped to meet your needs. The less information you give them, the less likely they are to satisfy your expectations or the expectations of your attendees. Now I'm really going to shift and focus almost exclusively on hosting a collegiate level event because that's the most comparable thing to any kind of seminar or major convention that you might be coordinating in the future. First, let's talk about hotel. When your people come from around the state or around the country, they're going to be in need of a hotel. Now, please do not think Houston is big with lots of hotels. They can call one. No. You want your people at one central hotel so that, or one central place, so, or, or maybe if necessary, two hotels if you run out of space at one. You want them there so that if you have to communicate with them in the evening, like if you have to post announcements about altered time schedules, or in our case, what we have to do, we finish our competition at around 8 or 9 o'clock on Friday and Saturday evening, and the tournament participants expect us to post the results in the hotel lobby. We don't want them hanging around the university until 11 or 12, uh, 12 o'clock midnight waiting for the results. We want them to go eat, go relax, and we'll bring the results to you as soon as they're done. Okay? You have similar needs regardless of the kind of event that you're, you're hosting. So in terms of hotel, there are some things that you need to consider. Top of the list is proximity of the hotel to the actual event site. Now, sometimes the hotel is the location of the event site. And in meeting and seminar arrangements, frequently, especially if you have a big educational seminar that's being taught in a huge room, then the hotel will be the conference facility you use. But let's pretend it's not. Well, we throw in a whole bunch of challenges when we do this now. You need a hotel that is roughly I would say no more than a 10 to 15 minute drive from the actual location of your event. I will give you an example of, from what I have been told, is a potential problem with a recent event in Houston. Last January, as well as for the next two Januaries in Houston, Houston will be host to the National Home Builders Convention. And this convention, from what I'm told, is being hosted the last weekend of January every year for three solid years. The biggest complaint that I have heard from hotel coordinators is that people attending this convention, and there was something like an estimated, and I'm pulling a number out, I've been told it was 50 to 75,000 people that were expected, enough to fill the Astrodome. The biggest complaint was once they got to Houston, they had to drive, in some cases, 45 to 60 minutes just to get to the Astro Domain. Okay? Well, if you've got 60, 75,000 people, where are they going to stay? Okay? And literally, they have to stay everywhere. Every single hotel Every in this hotel area. Every hotel in the Harris County fills up. I mean, we, tr we tried. I know this from firsthand knowledge or firsthand experience. We tried to get a hotel for a college event that weekend. The closest hotel we could get was Galveston. So. We didn't pick that weekend. <laughs> no, that's why we have moved. So proximity is key. Secondly, you as an event planner have the opportunity to negotiate a special price and or special amenities for your attendees. So keep in mind, the hotel will always have a posted room rate per night. And if you are hosting a nonprofit event where the proceeds go to a charitable organization, you usually can argue for a greater discount than if you have a for-profit event being hosted at that hotel. Now, I'll give you an example. On the collegiate level, 
I know that the norm for room rates for traveling teams, especially in this part of Texas, is somewhere between 40 and $46 per night. And we are staying at hotels that are of the quality of, say, hotels that would normally charge 80 to $95 per night. And I go into the hotel coordinator, as I've done this past week, and I've explained to that person, we can fill up half of your hotel. That's important. Tell them that. Because you have just told them, I have a whole lot of room nights that you can sell. And if you let me have this rate, I'll fill up your hotel. If you don't let me have this rate, I'll find someone who will. So keep in mind, this is one of the few negotiating tools that you have. And you're not making any profit from that discount. What you're doing is you are ensuring that your attendees will come. If we sent out a college invitation that said $70 room reservations, let me tell you what would happen. All, the, all of the schools that would attend would call around and get a better deal. They'd go to Motel 6 or what have you, some place that would be much less expensive. However, we've been able to arrange with a very good hotel that's about six minutes from the university, a rate of $50 per night. And I know those rooms usually go for $95 per night. And so you have Let me interject yes. here. When the hotel rep comes, you may want to ask Jane how she assesses, compare what she says to this. What Mike is telling you is true. But see from her point of view uh, what she's going to tell you about how they make a judgment call on sizes of groups and types of institutions. Excuse me. No, no problem. And there is something else that I have to admit operates in our favor. We host five total events on this campus. Martha mentioned the three, and I think she was referring to the collegiate events that we host. But we host a middle school tournament. It is a joy to run. And a high school tournament here on this campus. And we have to make these kinds of arrangements for all of them. I make sure to tell the person I'm dealing with, I host five events per year. And if I use your hotel for all five of these, I will sell a whole lot of rooms for you. So you would like to get me for all of these events. Therefore, this is the rate I need for you to get me for one. OK? And so make sure to announce the benefits that, or rather, the usage that you bring, and you can negotiate a better price. Now, I'll give you another example, though. Just because your event is a certain size does not mean you're going to get this kind of price rate. Keep in mind, we are representing non-profitable educational institutions. However, if you are trying to negotiate on behalf of the Texas Bar Association, I can guarantee you a $95 room might go for 90 OK? You have to keep in mind the kind of organization you're representing when you're negotiating these hotel deals. Look for amenities that the hotel will offer. Do they have a free continental breakfast available in the morning? And this is way at the top of the list. Do they have in and out parking privileges? OK? There are several hotels that have contacted me recently about events that we're hosting, but they don't have in and out parking privileges. And college teams are not going to pay 5 to $7 every time they leave a parking lot. Okay? And if they're traveling here in rented vehicles, they're not taking cabs, they have to pay per vehicle. So you've taken what is a $50 per night room rate, and let's say, let's say you have two, peop two rooms being used by a university, and they have two vehicles. Suddenly, $100 becomes 114 if they leave once. And if they leave and change clothes and then go out to eat again after the competition's over, now it's $128. So keep in mind the prices and the amenities that the hotel is willing to offer you. Okay? Now, some people might be thinking, I wonder if they have indoor pools. It depends if, that, if, if the kind of event you're hosting is, allows time for playtime or vacation time. The events that we host, hypothetically, have a play time. But the people that are competing are usually so high strung, they are going to be doing their best to get in bed, let alone flop around in a pool. Secondly, under facilities, we have to talk about the conference rooms themselves. And this is where you must make an advance request and reservation. You can have the hotel, you can be on the calendar, you can have contacted the right people. But if you don't have the space available when they get here, you can't have an event. Okay? 
Now, I'll give you one good example because I had to resolve this here on this campus yesterday. I know that for us to have this high school tournament next week, we have to have two large auditoriums that can seat roughly 500 people. That's one for the high school students and one for their coaches and judges. We separate them. And then we have to have 60 classrooms for competition. Okay? Let me tell you what shock, fright, and a nightmare is. This is when you casually peruse the room list that your reservations people have given you, and they've written a little note. These are all the rooms we can find. This is not a good note. Not a good <laughs> note. Let us know if you need more. And I thought, OK, OK, don't hyperventilate. Chill. Count the rooms. And I counted the rooms the first time, and there were 53. And I thought, OK, well, that's not too bad, but I know I need more. If I rant and rave like I normally do, I'll get more. But oh my gosh, there are no auditoriums on this list. Question, where am I going to put 900 high school kids when they're not competing at a tournament if I have no auditoriums? Do I tell them, take 10 rooms and go 60 each or something like that? Hang in the lobby. <laughs> Hang in the lobby, you know, uh, go to the U of H fountain, go sit in front of the UC on the grass. It doesn't happen. You have to have a central meeting place for your people to congregate in. So I contacted the organization that I knew had reserved those rooms and were supposed to release them to me, explaining, I have to have these rooms. Please release them in writing because we can't have our event if we don't have this facility. And they have done so. And to be honest, this is probably, now, now in fairness to me, you might think, why did you not check weeks ago? Well, let me give you the answer to that. I made this request eight weeks ago. However, here on a university campus, you can't schedule anything until classes begin and until all the rooms have been requested for class purposes. So until last week, I had no clue as to what rooms would actually be available. And so I got, I'd had, had this list probably for about three days. And so, OK, throw stones at me. I was two days late. I should have looked at it the first day. But the point is, you're going to have to look at that list and make sure and get ready, get ready to negotiate for your events facilities. Get ready. This is not something where everyone's going to hand you exactly what you need and say, have the best event in the world. We have no conflicts at all. That does not happen, nor does it happen at most hotels. Although, let me interject. Mm -hmm. If you know, you know you're running a state convention of 500 or whatever, and you know that you need 10 or 12 breakout rooms, that's the sort of thing that goes into the hotel contract on the front end. And then 90% of the time, those rooms are there. Sometimes they've decided to renovate and forgot to tell you and didn't think it would really matter. Or your group gets larger and you need, you know, the rooms that you originally agreed upon won't hold the people anymore. But at least if you write it into the hotel contract, you're in much better shape. If you don't have it in the contract at all, the odds are the hotel has sold that space to someone else. And keep in mind, anytime you can lock someone into a contract, you have a great negotiating ability. But when you are on a university or any other kind of educational campus, you have to deal with the priorities that are established there. And often you have to wait until you can resolve everybody's needs. And but especially sign, sign memos help. Sign memos help a whole bunch, saying that you asked in advance and you were given in advance. Now, here is one that you need to think about and because this typically will have anywhere from a $21 to $30 impact per room for a conference, okay? And it's one of the hidden costs that you have to think about. If you are dealing with organizations that are tax exempt, do not think they just show up and say, I'm tax exempt, and they get the taxes <laughs> taken off their bill. Most hotels, under the auditing provisions of general, generally accepted accounting principles, require that a tax exemption with the name of their organization and the IRS tax ID be visible on a form when you check in. Sometimes they'll let you turn it in when you check out. Now, keep in mind, most locations around the country, or many locations around the country, many counties, in fact, have a 
local hotel tax on top of the sales tax. I know when we go to Huntsville, which is outside of Harris County, there is a local, I think it's a hotel tax that we mm -hmm. have to pay. Total tax is around 15%. So 15% on a $50 room, you know, that's $7.50 per room per night, okay? So it is important for you to check with the hotel as to how they will allow tax-exempt organizations to get the, the refund, the credit. And you also need to tell the organizations that are coming in your invitation letter, this is how you obtain tax exemption. Let me explain as a director why. If you have not given that instruction and they show up at the hotel and they mm -hmm. don't get their tax exemption, they won't blame it on the hotel. They will blame it on you because mm -hmm. you directed the event. We might show them this. Let me get a wide shot here. I know you can't read the small print, but this is a copy of our contract uh, with the Ramada. And you'll see things, in, you know, the overview stuff. Uh, here is the agreement on the specific number of rooms. Sleeping room rate of $49 a night. Uh, quad occupancy plus 9% tax, which means you can put four people in there and it's still $49 a night. That's a good deal, we think. And yep. then I'll just do the rest of this okay. real quick. And then it runs on through. You've got the check-in, check-out, room rates, reservations, credit, billing, advance deposit, security, food, beverage, uh, things that the coordinators have to worry about. You don't. Cancellation, uh, approval, and so forth. And then the signatures of the people that are responsible for communicating that. You don't have to remember all those parts of the uh, contract. I just wanted you to be aware that that's sort of what they look like and and if you were booking conference rooms too then that would be over there uh, specified under your total number of rooms but the more things you, some contracts run eight or ten pages you know the bigger the convention this is relatively simple because it's just seating I mean it's just sleeping rooms okay we've talked about hotel we have talked about conference rooms and I made a separate listing on this visual aid regarding parking and the reason I do that, it's not because I'm a parking fanatic. It is because this may be one of your biggest problems that you have to deal with. Again, keep in mind, unlike high school types of events, which some of you may be familiar with, collegiate events are just like any professional activity that you would have with regards to transportation. More likely than not, people coming from out of state have flown here. And in just about every case, someone's had to rent a car or a van or multiple vehicles, and they're going to have to get them to your facility. Now, let me ask you this question, just, and this is just a hypothetical question to think about. When you come to this campus every day, for those of you that come to this campus or any other campus, you look for parking lots. And what has given you the right to park in that parking lot? prepayment of a fee to the University of Houston. That's right. And how many public parking spaces are allocated for visitors that you are aware of on this campus? Not many. That's right. Now, if I have a collegiate event and I know there's limited free parking and I know it's basically near the university center and my event is four blocks away, okay, and I've got 120 vehicles to put somewhere and they don't have decals. What should I do? Yes. Would the coordinator get some sort of decal or, or something to put in the rear view mirror or, or even a placard that says, this is the group and here's the people that stole the parking lot. Mm -hmm. That 120 automobiles without view of HID will be there. Don't tow any of them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, towing, that is another issue. Yes. yes. That is pretty much the right answer. Let me restate it and I'll give you a little bit more insight. You need to make sure that there is some arrangement that you've made and communicated to your meeting attendees as to where to park. You know, we have how many parking lots on the main campus? Ooh, about 15, 20? No, I can't count. And you need to know where to park. If they are required to have a visitor pass, you're going to have to get it to them somehow. Well, question, if they show up to your campus for the first time, or if the first time that they show up is the time that they see you and they've parked blocks away, 
Are you going to turn around and give them a visitor hanging decal and tell them walk back to your car in the cool weather we're experiencing and put this in your rear view mirror? How, okay, they might take it and smile. Oh, sure, I'll do this. How many will actually do it? And there's one, one or two universities that I deal with on a regular basis that, and I, I must admit, every time I'm handed this parking decal, I'm saying to myself, this is a private university. There is no way you're going to tell me. I know you don't have tow trucks on this university. And I will, I, I, it's an imposition that I should not have to make. Okay? So what do we do here as an example? What we have done, and this is an idea, you can contact the respective, you know, if you have private security, and I consider U of H security to be like private security. Well, we, 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 we're going to treat them like that for the purpose of this, dis this discussion. We've communicated with them in, in advance and told them there will be this many extra cars in this one parking lot on this weekend. These people are guests of the university. Please do not ticket them. If you see large school buses, and there will be, oh, 20 or 30, Please don't move the school buses. They are here for a legitimate purpose. And it's, it makes it a whole lot easier for them and for us if they will take the memo, which they do. They act upon it. They know the parking lot where things will be. And no one has to take decals out there. And everybody's happy. But if you have not made that arrangement, and, and I will be honest with you, this is a fine-tuning detail. Unfortunately, a lot of meeting planners, unfortunately, fail on this one little detail, and yet it's one of the most frustrating and irritating things that I think anyone could be asked to go through. And here we coordinate with campus police so that they can be both visible for the event, which is helpful, but also that they can help facilitate things because those buses need to unload in front of Arnold Hall in this case, and then they need to move over by the football stadium. And we don't need a bus jam out there when the shuttle bus is trying to get you into campus. Right. Now, in the event that you cannot get free parking, okay, keep in mind, I'm trying to keep track of costs here. We, remember, we've got, it, let's hypothetically think back. Let's say we have a university that needs two rooms and a hotel per night. Okay, let's just start talking about average costs that they could incur if you don't help them out in planning. So $100 per night. Let's say that they don't have in and out privileges. Oh, no, no, let's not do that. Let's say that they haven't made the proper tax exemption procedure. Okay? So they're going to have to pay tax if they really don't have to pay. Let's say that that tax is $750 a night. So now we've got $15 in extra cost that you could have saved them if you'd made the right arrangement. And they're going to be perturbed. Now let's say they come to the campus. And let's say that. There is no possible way you could get free parking for them. Or there's no possible way you could, could have gotten free parking in and out privileges at a hotel. Now, downtown, the average in and out privilege is $7. Okay? And let's say they leave the hotel in the morning to go to the event. They come back, change clothes, and go out to eat after the event. You've now tacked on, let's say, two cars, $28. We're now up to $43 extra dollars that possibly could have been saved by the planner. Yes? One sure solution to that, that's valet parking. I mean, that never counts as valet parking. I mean, it will give the hotel tips, but if you don't want to make me a deal, and you don't want to let my people go in and out, no problem. We'll all valet park. We'll bring the hotel to Grinders Hall because they don't have enough valet parking. Unfortunately, the hotels that I'm familiar with downtown, I'm not going to say I'm familiar with all of them, and I won't cite any names for fear of publicizing one versus the other. But the ones that I've checked with charge you the same for valet parking, if not more, in and out. Yes. I mean, yeah, because there's only one. A lot of them do charge for valet parking. There's only one parking lot. You know, you get in and get out. You know, in some places, they don't give you a choice. Yeah, okay. We better move along. All right. Uh, but, but I'm trying to encourage you to think about the things you have to tell your people that you can or cannot do for them. And if you can't get free parking, make sure to tell them. Okay, now let's talk about vendors and supplies. This is something that deals with the actual amenities of the event itself. And I won't spend nearly as much time explaining this, except I want to make one big point. You need 
desperately to resolve some issues in terms of things you will be distributing, arranging, or coordinating during the event well in advance of it because these are not things that are easily resolved within 24 hours of an event or even a week of an event. Uh, number, so I guess the, the number one point is I consider these to be very time consuming. I also find this part somewhat frustrating except in cases where I have established relationships with vendors because you're having to rely on people that are outside your university or outside your activity and they are typically for-profit institutions and you basically have to give them a delivery time date and hope they show up on time okay so let me give you a few examples in front of me we've had sitting this first place in sweepstakes I'm now publish, publicizing the University of Houston Forensic Society first place in sweepstakes that was awarded at the United States Air Force Academy speech tournament last year in Colorado Springs this is not just a bronze falcon on a block of wood. Let me tell you what I see when I look at this, when I, I look at <laughs> what work it represents. If you have an event where you want to give a special order item away as an award or a gift or a prize, this isn't the sort of thing that you can just go out to a mall or to a trophy store and find in mass quantity, okay? This is about the most expensive trophy that is awarded in the United States at a collegiate forensic tournament. I'm just guessing, but I, I think this is in the neighborhood of $175 to $250. And the Air Force is known for giving the most spectacular awards. You have to order something like this, I would guesstimate, best of my, my experience, a minimum, minimum of three to five weeks in advance because it's not something that will be lying around in mass. And, and how many of those do they give away at a tournament? Let's see, at the Air Force tournament, they give away somewhere in close to 40, okay? We brought home over 20 of them. <laughs> right, we, we did extremely well last year, as we have in prior years. Another thing to pay attention to, especially if you're giving an award out, what I know took a lot of time on this and cost a whole lot more than an average trophy, as you can see, this is something close to a plaque, even though it's a great big trophy. This had to be <coughs> engraved individual letter by individual letter. Let me see if I can stick that under here for our home viewers. Okay. Or can you zoom in on this, Charles? I think you got it, yeah. Right down to the plaque. When you buy an award like this that, that requires individual engraving, you are paying per letter, 25 to 50 cents per letter. So 40 of these times, you know, I'm just wild guess, 25 letters, you know, your printing alone because of the decision you made to give this trophy is going to run a major bill, okay? So if you're planning on doing anything unique in terms of awards, prizes, gifts, or whatever it is you're giving out, make sure that you have given yourself, I would guess, at a minimum, six weeks to get the item, make sure that the prototype of the item is what you want and that you can get it mass produced and physically in your hands two to three weeks in advance of the event. Just, and here's my reason for being anal on that accord, like I'm not anal on quite a few others. If you get these and they've, they've misspelled letters, or rather words, or they've got one eagle or falcon that looks like it's dead, it's laying on its <laughs> side, or we've actually it's had wing some. wing is drooping. Yeah, I mean, we've had some where you could pick this up and you've got, got a screw that, that long underneath, or it's not really bolted down. Do you want to give that out? <laughs> but if that's all you have, what do you do? You give it out. So uh, I'll give you one, one quick story. When I ran the national championships in forensics at Rice in April 1983, in, in 1993, I was sent a shipment of, gosh, I'll say 15 to 30, no, no, 25 boxes of acrylic and pewter awards. Now, with the acrylic awards, we had to undo each one of probably 264 of them and put on little acrylic feet on every single one. Yes, we got them from the trophy company, and we had to put on little bitty feet 
it was anal, it was frustrating, it took three days, okay? Then came the pewter. Now, it would have been so easy if I had been sent these pewter plates that range in size from this to this, you know, the Whopper, okay? <laughs> and they had been engraved already, but I was told, no, one of your jobs as the national tournament director is to get these engraved. And I've been dealing with trophy shops for a long time, and I, I can get plaques engraved, I can get lots of things engraved, but I didn't know how to get a pewter plate engraved. Now, after I found one that would do it for, I think, 75 cents a letter, okay, and we're talking a lot of writing on these things, my nightmare occurred when, let's see, I think I got the pewter seven days before the event. Okay, so that's problem number one. Problem number two is finding a trophy company that will engrave them quickly and will get them back in my hands in three business days, which means you're rushing them. And then I got them all, and I was sent no extra pewter plates. And these pewter plates were going to be awarded to the top six people in the nation in the 11 different competitive events. And I got this phone call. Mr. Fain, we have your plates ready, but we messed up on one of the finalists in dramatic interpretation. I think it was the first place plaque. Now, keeping in mind the ego and the emotional states of someone in the national finals of dramatic inter, and then to, for me to be told they messed up the first place plate that will go to the national champion, I, I told them, you need to fly to Pennsylvania, where those pewter plates are from, get another one, and get back here in 24 hours. I must have this pewter plate. Fortunately, they found that they had dropped one in the back that was the one extra that I was sent, and we got this thing engraved. But for 24 hours, I'm like in a state of panic. It's like, what do I do? Do I go to Macy's and ask for pewter? You know, I don't know. <laughs> Could you so, match this, please? <laughs> you know, and, and this, this, this was a unique special order item. So this is your worst nightmare, is when you're having to deal with timing of a special order item, like a trophy, an award, or maybe even a printing uh, publication. Food arrangements are also critical. Let's say that you're, if you're having an event at a hotel and your people are given a time to eat, but that does not mean you provide the food, your life is easy. You basically say, oh, time to go eat lunch, bye. But if you are under an obligation to make food resources available, much as we are at a lot of conferences, and especially at high school and collegiate forensic tournaments. You have to have someone that you trust providing food in mass quantity at that a That you can eat. That you can eat. That's, well, no, <laughs> as long as it's, you know, they can stick it in their mouth, no. Um, <laughs> that, that you can swallow is fine, and you have to make the call in advance. I would get, say, at a minimum, at a minimum two weeks. I'll give you a good for instance. Next week, I have, you know, I have to order from one pizza vendor, one pizza vendor, 180 pizzas in 18 hours. They have to bring me 60 at a designated time on Friday and 120 in two designated trips on Saturday. Now, I'm relying on a pizza driver to bring me, a, a one driver to bring me 180 pizzas. Now, have I established a high level of trust with this pizza vendor, meaning I believe he will be there you know, regardless of whatever problems. I don't care if the car explodes, he'll run. You know? <laughs> he'll I call mean, a taxi. I have to have the food here. That's it, period. Okay? And that's something that you have to think. Oh, and here's another reason. And uh, I literally called my pizza vendor last night. And I said, listen, I know I'm running a few days late. But here's what I need. I need the normal order. Normal means for me means 180 pizzas in a day. And I need it by next week. Now, why is it important to call this guy? You might think, well, you know, I'll, I'll list a multiple number of pizza vendors so I don't give any special favors to anyone indirectly. Uh, if you call Pizza Inn, Pizza Hut, Domino's, Mr. Gaddy's, what have you, I think that got a good number. Then you have to ask yourself, you know, you might think. CC's. CC's, that's okay. another one, we'll CC's. Fair okay. time. Yes. You, have, you might think, well, they make pizzas all the time. That's all they do. They just make pizza. They've just got it there. Wrong. Do you know how much dough it takes and how many supplies <laughs> they have to have in advance 
to make 180 pizzas like that? And that's if I'm their only customer. Of course, on a Friday and Saturday, no one else is ordering pizza from them. And how many people are they going to believe who phone up and say, oh, could you bring 80 pizzas over in an hour? You know, I mean, they know me, they know my voice, and I know this manager, and he knows that I pay him a whole bunch of money to bring me a bunch of pizzas at those designated times. And if they're not there at that designated time, we will have a major problem. You okay. also get a nice discount, don't you? Um, yes. You definitely need to seek quantity discounts, definitely. Now, I didn't say anything about our special rate being $5.25, and for anyone in the listening audience that works for a pizza place and give me a better deal, give me a call. <laughs> but uh, the rate that I negotiate, when I was at Rice, I negotiated a $4 per pizza rate. And I've stayed with the same vendor, and I've, I've ordered a good 2,000 pizzas. I mean, I, own, I should own stock in this company at this point. But I have to trust that they'll be there, OK? Uh, I, I have a similar arrangement with a food place, a, a sandwich place that I call. And in fact, I'll be calling them this afternoon. And I will tell them, I need 10 six-foot sandwiches delivered at this point. This sounds Looney Tunes if you don't know who the person is. If you made a phone call from your home like that, do you think they would believe you? <laughs> OK, so I mean, you have to have established relationships <laughs> And you know they have to trust you and know who you are. And you ha in, in all these instances, I have gone out and physically met the manager and explained, here are my needs. Here's what I'm doing. I'm fully legitimate. And I'll, the first time, I will give you a deposit check just to prove I'm legitimate. But after this, I will pay you within the week of the event. And that, that, that's fair. That's very reasonable. Okay. So you're dealing in large quantities. Uh, I want to make sure I go over these last points now. <coughs> Pardon me. The availability of copy facilities and the ability to mass produce handouts is very important. When I ran the nationals at Rice, we had to rent two different copy machines that could mass produce, get this, had to mass produce 130 copies of a 35 page document, which is the national tournament results summary, in an hour and 15 minutes collated and stapled, OK? Now, what happened? I, I mean, all good plans get punished right. I had rented the best possible copiers I could find. I mean, we were ready. I had students standing by the machines that failed and did not work. And I realized, oh, goodness. The awards assembly for the nationals has to happen at 7. And I don't have the results in my hands. And it's 5.45. It's time for plan B. So I got on the phone, and I called a local copy vendor. Again, I will not give names. And I said, listen, I will pay you to shut down right now. I will give you my American Express number. And I'm going to have a student flying in there in about 10 minutes. I need you to give me 130 copies of this document pronto now. Okay? And yes, we paid 350 bucks for that. But you know, considering this event was on the I would guess, $35,000 to $40,000 scale in terms of all the money that was being spent here. And considering that it brought in the neighborhood of $800,000 to the Houston economy, that $350 was something that had to happen. And so you have to have backup plans in case your physical plans and your physical resources that, you, that are your primary things you're relying upon don't pan out. Okay? So always have backup plans ready. Finally, uh, Martha, I think you wanted to show some visual aids here. Uh, with the, like on the, the handouts? Yeah, like the ballots and okay. such. Yeah, you don't need the content of this, but this is a, a typical University of Houston ballot. We ran 80 sets of six pages of these in three different colors so that they're color coded that you can uh, run ahead of time. And that's the main thing that we were going to interject here. Get as much of that copying done ahead of time as you can. We go through a tremendous uh, number of ballots. This is, oh, I can't really read it, but uh, this is a Lincoln-Douglas debate ballot. Uh, there are cross-examination debate ballots. Uh, hey, Martha, while you're on this one, let, let me make a point here. Let's say that you have some event that requires a form to be filled out or a special assessment to be completed by your meeting attendees, okay? 
we do not have any kind of printing uh, setup for that ballot. That ballot has to be ordered six weeks in advance, no. for, in that case, from Northridge, California. And so, like, I've had, for this upcoming tournament, I've had to order ballots from Wisconsin to get here. Now, this comes on NCR paper, you know, three copies, color-coded, so that the tab room gets one color, uh, one team gets a color, the other team gets a color. So a lot of those supplies just need to be ordered ahead of time. Now, the last thing I want to talk about, and I will go over this in brief, but let me have you put a few asterisks or stars on your notes. This really is the most critical thing to do for the event itself, and that is running the event during the time schedule that you've established for that meeting or that convention or that seminar. And so I, I call this section deadlines and schedules. First of all, you need to have very clearly established deadlines for registration by attendees and for them entering, in our, our situation, the tournament. Now, why is this important? Okay? And why is it important to have, give you enough lead time? Okay? And my attitude toward deadlines and schedules is this. The deadline, if you've done all of your advanced communication properly, then the deadline that you establish is for your benefit, not for the benefit of the attendees. The event is for the attendees, but the deadline is something you do for yourself. Okay? Give yourself enough time to receive the information, assess the size of the event that you're going to have, and make sure you have not overextended the number of entries that you have accepted. A, a perfect example. I told you that our high school tournament last year had 44 high schools and 900 students in attendance. This year, I'm anticipating that we will have 50 to 55 high schools wanting to attend and probably about that many students. But let's go back to a fact I told you earlier. I told you that I'm estimating I need 60 rooms. Okay. Keep that in mind. Now, if I have 50 high schools and all of them want to enter four debate teams, that gives me 200 debate teams. If I have 60 rooms and I put two debate teams in each room for the tournament, that means I can take 120. I now have 80 debate teams that I have nowhere to put. So the answer is not find a grassy area and sit down and debate. The answer is I only accept the number that I have the facilities to accommodate. There is no shame in monitoring the size of your event to ensure you don't go over capacity. I'll just throw this question at you. Have any of you been on an airline uh, trip and your plane was oversold or overbooked and you had to wait? Isn't that fun? Makes you cranky. Mm -hmm. You ever been to a hotel that told you you had a reservation, but because you got there too late, they gave your room away, they had oversold for the night? You love that experience, right? <laughs> Similarly, people don't want to show up and be told that you made a mistake and you should have told them that they, they, they weren't accepted. And they just need to pick one of their debate teams to watch right. this time. Uh, and last year, we had the unfortunate situation where a high school coach thought she had entered three debate entries, and she gets here and says, oh, but you can just put them somewhere. No, no, we can't. Uh, we are filled to the brim, and I'm sorry. And those of you that know about tournaments know that debate teams have to be paired and matched and scheduled. And so you can only have two debate teams hitting each other in a round. Okay, there's no such thing as parliamentary debate. Meeting you, each other. Right. So keep in mind, <laughs> You, must, you mm -hmm. must monitor the size of the event to ensure you have not overextended your facilities. Now, there are those people in the audience that might say, Dr. Fade, the University of Houston is loaded with rooms. That is true. I am also unwilling, as you should be, to go beyond my manpower, or let me be PC, my human power resources. Last year, we allowed 55 rooms to be used. This year, I'm allowing us to go up about 10% because I want to make sure that we can control the event and keep it efficient and effectively run. 
And as with hotels, we're not the only event on campus. That's right. There's some toss testing going on Saturday morning. Other groups may be holding conferences on campus. Now, let me talk very briefly as we get ready to wrap up about what you do during the actual event. Now, I've talked about monitoring your entries and monitoring your size and not getting bigger than you can accommodate. Now, let's talk about the time schedule. And for anyone that's been on one of my teams and that has seen me run a tournament, <coughs> they will tell you that we stay on time. And this is my philosophy. My philosophy is, though you may have to push your judges, you may have to push your event coordinators, you may have to keep teachers from going over time in lectures, the audience that's there, the customers that you are serving, know what the schedule is. And regardless of how much they've been pushed, regardless of what you have done that might irritate them, they will remember whether or not you stayed on time. Don't think because they're enjoying it, they will let you go over. How many of you have been to a church or educational lecture that had a speaker that got really excited, and the audience was really excited, and the speaker misinterpreted the nonverbals that he or she was receiving from the audience, and they thought, well, I can just keep on going. They're having a good time. Wrong. People start looking at their watches, and they may, may be smiling, but they want you to wrap up because your time is over. And the chorus keeps singing, one more encore. You know, no. You keep your event on time. Now, for those of you that have experience with high school tournaments, I know they have a notorious reputation for being over time and late, not ours. And the reason that people come back is because we get them out of here on time. And there's one other thing that we do that you might, this is a special thing about the events that we run here that you might want to use as an idea. One of the things that runs competitive events of this nature late is the fact that people are waiting around for results after the preliminary rounds are over on Friday night. And that may take an hour to two hours because you have people in the tab tabulation room trying to tabulate results for these 120 teams. Plus well, all the individual events. Yes. That's going on too. I mean, Sometimes you, it's just you, you've got a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> what we do is we realize there is no benefit to, and we were innovators in this too, by the way. I, I do pound our back for this one. We were innovators. We said, listen, we are accomplishing nothing keeping these high school coaches and students here for two hours trying to find out if they advanced. We will send them home. Go home, we tell them. Leave and call phone numbers where we will record the debate results. And we give them one number for one version of debate and a second for the other version of debate. And Considering that some of these high schools have to go and ride an hour and a half to get home, this saves them a ton of time. And By the time they get home, we've got the voicemail messages set up. Right. And so that's something that you can think about doing for your event. Don't be afraid to use recorded messages. We're in a new era of voicemail. Leave messages for people if you have to. Okay? You can even call the hotel if you need and give them, tell them, I need everyone in this block of rooms to receive the following message. Please record it and distribute it. The, the monitor, just like you have outside the doorway here, and you home viewers may or may not have seen this, but the, the monitors in the hotels that run the list of events for the day can put all kinds of announcements in there, room changes, where things are posted, just announcements. Well, Martha was a wee bit concerned, although I was not, that I would be able to fill up this amount of time. And <laughs> I think I have You've been... you still got three or four minutes. Oh, gosh. Well, <laughs> but are there any questions from anyone in the audience? Anything? About any facet of this? Let me again stress, I hope for the home viewers, there were no questions. But They've got our phone numbers. Right. They know how to call in. But what I do want to say to you is, and I hope I've been successful in triggering some ideas and enabling you to compare this kind of collegiate event with all kinds of events that you might have to coordinate. I also don't know if Dr. Hahn has said this previously, but 
the job and role of the meeting manager, according to industry surveys, is supposed to be one of the most booming and optimistic or opp opportunistic in the future. Uh, because it, it is no small task to coordinate 300 to 1,000 people in a schedule that's designated for a day and a half to three day time period. You this need nerves of steel, you need organizational skills, you need people working with you. There was one bit I was going to add earlier, but I wasn't sure how our time was working out. We were talking about staying on schedule, keeping things moving. Those meal functions often have to do with that, and when our catering rep comes, you'll want to pursue this more. But there was one tournament that you all went to, a national one, I think, mm -hmm. that had a buffet line set up instead of a seated meal. And what did it take, two hours for everybody to go through that line? Three hours, and people Three. Just still do not get through. Yeah, and that's just awful. And so there, if you've got to be, we fed 2,300 people at a national tournament here decades ago uh, out of the hotel near Astroworld. But, you know, if the hotel knows they're serving a banquet of 23 people and that food needs to be on the table within 15 or 20 minutes, they need to hire extra people. They will, good hotels, will hire the additional staff to compensate for that. But in no way would you put 2,000 people through a buffet line mm -hmm. unless you had 10 buffet lines going down. You know, you'd really have to have access, but you certainly wouldn't put them uh, down a double line to do that. You can do things like preset the table with the dessert and the salad so your waiters don't have to make, and waitresses don't have to make so many trips. Um, or the, can you think of other big snafus that you've run into oh, gosh. Um, that can be told on public television? That can be told on public television. Mm, yes, I can. I recall when I was running the, and this is not a snafu, this was a challenge. When I was running the Nationals at Rice, we were required to have a tournament booklet with all of the sectioning for all of the prelims produced for every single person in attendance. But here was the catch. We didn't get the data to, pr to produce this booklet from until the National Tournament Director arrived here and had adjusted it for drops and ads of the tournament the Monday before the tournament began on Friday. So he flies in on a Monday. Tuesday morning, he's doing drops and ads. This gives me, let's see, 48 hours to go to our printing sponsor, which was one of the major oil companies at that point, give it to their graphics department, pray they have no internal work to do because this was a charitable function they were serving. And they had to turn around a, let's see, a 20,000 page copy job bound collated with a cover and binding, mind you, in 48 hours. So again, you have to be prepared. You, you might think, well, you can do that in advance. No, you were at the mercy of certain constraints of the organization and certain demands of the entry. You have to be prepared and you have to have identified in advance the times when you need to be using NyQuil or something to control your nerves because there are going to be stress points. I know for our high school tournament next week exactly when those points will occur. My team has told me that when I work out and go to the gym, I'm a much better person at the tournament. So next We just sort of cordon him off, you know, and let him so, zoom in one spot. So next Friday I will go and work out because that evening I will not be in a good mood. So. But if you know, like we were saying, if you know your vendors, if you know your suppliers, if you know you can trust people, you know, and, and as you begin to do meetings over time, you'll develop your favorite florist or your favorite caterer or whatever it is that, uh, you know, the specialty gift shop that can meet your needs. So that you know that if you call up this particular person and say, I need a floral arrangement in the 100 to $150 range, it needs to last five days, you know, don't send roses, uh, give me chrysanthemums, give me something the hotel can stick in the fridge. Oh, and it will keep. You can trust that person to do that, and you don't have to go over and flip through a catalog. Or you can say, I need a sheet cake shaped like the state of Alaska with chocolate icing to feed 125 people. And you know that this is a person who's capable of doing that and of, of 
if they say, yes, I can do it and I'll do a good job for you, then you can count on that. So if you have questions, think about those. We'll follow up on them. We want to thank Dr. Michael Fain, our uh, Director of Individual Events at the University of Houston, for his contributions today and helping us understand how to manage meetings effectively. Thanks. Thank you very much.